Good morning, everyone. My name is Mahi Nakram. I'm from Kashmir. Um, I'm a double major in economics and political science here at Wellesley College. Um, it is my honor today to introduce Professor Samita Radhakrishnan, who is an associate professor in sociology here at Wellesley. Her research examines the cultural, financial, and political dimensions of gender and globalization with a particular focus on India, South Africa, and United States. Her current project uses microfinance as a window into the newly dominant anti-poverty practices that merge profit motivations with social ones, shining a bright light on how gendered labor and class inequalities shape the globally stretched microfinance industry. A very interesting topic. Uh, starting with clients of for-profit microfinance institutions in India, Radhakrishnan traces up a set of transnational linkages between US and India, including loan officers, liaisons between US based and Indian microfinance institutions, peer-to-peer -peer lenders on Kiva.org, and wealthy impact investors. Her book, which we should read, appropriately Indian, Gender and Class in Transnational, uh, sorry, Gender and Culture in Transnational Class, is a multi-sided ethnographic examination of transnational Indian IT workers and argues that gendered arrangements with edu uh, within educated upward mobility families uh, give this group a disproportionate power in defining what it means to be Indian in the global economy. Um, India does send the maximum number of engineers to the US. Uh, so prior to this book, her research examined the cultural politics of post-apartheid South Africa based on extensive research with South uh, yeah, so South African Indian communities in Durban and its surrounding townships. I know that was a long introduction, but appropriately so because she can she did a lot of important work and continues continues to do so. Uh, please don't join your hands in welcoming Professor Radhakrishnan. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Maine, for that beautiful introduction, detailed introduction. Okay, so today the talk that I'm going to offer you is kind of a combination of both my projects. So she mentioned that I've done some work on microfinance for the past several years, and I had this other project in IT. So in this talk, I'm attempting to kind of put both of them together within a framework of gendered work. Um, and so even though the talk is about India, it has a lot of global implications for thinking about the service sector economy and gender and work in general. And so I hope that we can not only get into some of the details of the Indian context about this topic, but also be able to make linkages to similar phenomena happening elsewhere in the world. So I want to start by asking this question, women's empowerment. It's been around, term that's been around for about 40 years now. What is it? When I uh, say that term, what are some of the things that come to your mind? Do you roll your eyes because you're tired of hearing about it? Are you excited about it? Um, is there a particular kind of program that comes to mind? So share with me what, what comes to mind when, you th when someone says women's empowerment for you personally. Yes. Women helping Sorry. other women. Women helping other women, okay, so a sense that women are going to collectively kind of step up and help one another, a kind of collective sensibility of women's empowerment, great. What else? Yes. Um, giving women and uh, finances independent of their husband. Okay, good. So having some kind of an income or a livelihood that is not tied to a male breadwinner. We're going to talk about that a lot. Okay, great. What else? Western development narrative. Absolutely, right? So what, women's empowerment has become associated a lot with kind of Western development organizations coming in. When we think of empowerment, women's empowerment, we're really thinking about developing context. We seldom think about US women needing empowerment. And so it usually involves some kind of an outside force coming in. And that's why I thought maybe some of you are a little exhausted or have an eye rolling kind of feeling when you hear it because you're like, oh, not again, right? Um, and that there's certainly uh, reason to feel that way. Other things. Yeah. Providing for a woman to be independent. Uh-huh. Independent in what way? So someone mentioned financial independence. Are you thinking of a different kind of independence? Well, I think financial kind of goes into it, but like also just the ability to make her own decisions and not be tied to other family members or other obligations. Generally speaking, I feel like women are often described as people who like they're just they're defined by their relations to people rather than them as an individual person in society. And so I think providing for ways for them to be an independent individual in society, but like also have 
pathways for a good life in society. Okay, great. So, so many important points there. Decision making, right? So independent decision making that may or may not be tied to a livelihood, but the ability to forge one's own path as an individual and to have a woman not be defined entirely in relation to other family members, usually male family members. Anything else? Yeah. Um, keeping girls in school. Okay, education, right? So that's a big agenda, especially when you think about the developing world, for thinking about women's empowerment, especially in the last 10 years, there's been a big push for thinking about the girl child, right? And so before we get women's empowerment, we need girls to stay in school so that they can become educated enough to become empowered women in the future, right? Okay, so just from the these kinds of um, associations that we've collected just now, we can see that women's empowerment, it's a very multi-layered term. It doesn't mean one thing. It means different things to different people, and it depends on where you are in the world, what your background is, what you have come across in your own study, that, that to a large extent uh, you know, determines what you think of this term. I'm surprised no one mentioned Me Too, you know, or the current kind of moment where we do see um, a different kind of narrative of women's empowerment. Maybe it's not called this, but there's certainly a sensibility that speaking out against gendered violence right, is part of women's empowerment. And so in that sense, it's taking on a US um, you know, tone, I guess, in a way that, that it hasn't previously. So there, it's definitely a kind of multi-layered um, concept, right? So now here's, the, here's now we're going to pivot a little bit to India, because what I want to suggest to you is that this term, women's empowerment, it has a history. It, has, uh, it lands in different parts of the world in different ways and means something different depending on where it lands. So I'm going to talk about India specifically with the understanding that it's landed in different ways in different parts of the world, right? But I think you'll see some resonances with the way that it landed in India with other parts of the world as well. So let's think about India and give, I'm going to sort of run through a very brief history of women's empowerment in India specifically. So starting in the 1970s, Right, you had a whole host of social movements, counter-hegemonic social movements, that started thinking very, using this idea of empowerment as a key uh, mode of organizing. Right, so what were these social movements? These were peasant movements, um, feminist and women's movements, Gandhian movements for self-sufficiently, Dalit or untouchable movements for autonomy. What united all these movements, the reason I sort of mention all of these as a laundry list, is that these were all counter-hegemonic social movements. The idea for empowerment, their idea for empowerment, is that you take the perspectives of marginal folks and you put them in the center, right? And you create knowledge from that, from centering the knowledge of marginalized people. And why did they think that was a good idea to do? Well, not only, it was because all of these groups that I've mentioned were really not benefiting from India's modernization project. Right? So those early articulations of empowerment were really critiques of India's modernization project. The fact that it hadn't reached the peasants, the Dalits, the women, right? Uh, and, and it was sort of pushing back against these. So um, NGOs during the same time period, taking their cues from these social movements, started to really organize. And from the 80s onwards and into the 90s, you see a huge proliferation of NGOs in India. They're very much working in lockstep with these uh, social movements, but they're doing some more things. They're building some institutions. They're instituting things like informal literacy uh, for adults, right? Um, mass literacy campaigns of various kinds. These were all tremendously successful, right? And so the state starts to take notice that this mode of organizing marginalized people is actually quite powerful. Right? Now, around the same time, you have something going on in the international arena, right? So um, international intergovernmental organizations, right? The World Bank especially. There's a critique by the 80s or so, right, that is emerging from feminist scholars that says that, you know, this whole thing of just trying to throw women in with the modernization paradigm is not working so well for women. We need to rethink what that is and we need to put gender rather than women, right? So gendered relationships of power at the center and we need to think about women's empowerment in a much more critical way in order to have any type of gender policy be successful. Right, so that World Bank policy, uh, the World Bank starts to listen to Right, these kinds of feminist scholars, this ki these kinds of findings from feminist scholars, and they start to build programming that's specifically doing women's empowerment. Right, um, but now what's happened? A counter hegemonic movement has become mainstreamed into something a, a, a hegemonic organization and the uh, hegemonic kind of um, programs of the World Bank. Right now, at the same time, around the same period. From starting in the 1980s, 
state governments in India and you know throughout the country as well. Um, but uh, it's sort of some a scholar, Aradhana Sharma, uh, an anthropologist who's written about this. She dates it to about 1984 as the first time that the state of Rajasthan, a state in uh, northern India, takes up women's empowerment as an explicit state initiative. So there was a Rajasthan Women's Development Program (WDP) that was started in 1984. So that's where that's one uh, periodization. But this whole notion of women's empowerment starts making its way into government programming. This is where you see the very uh, early stages of microfinance growing up in India. It's actually a government program run by NABAR, the National uh, Agricultural Bank, essentially, that's devoted to rural development. They start saying, you know what, maybe we can sort of imitate what's going on in Bangladesh in a different way. We'll set up these self-help groups for women. They organize uh, and sort of organize one another, and then we'll connect them with banks. That was the earliest form of microfinance in India, right? So you can see now this counter hegemonic thing that started out kind of as a critique of modernization is increasingly getting mainstreamed and getting um, absorbed into the workings of the state, right? And the workings of not only uh, you know, specific states within India, but the entire um, national context as well as international actors are also starting to articulate this. Okay, so. In India, you've seen a number of really dramatic changes. Now, pulling back a little bit and thinking about um, you know, what's happened since then. I talked about kind of an early period. You see a tremendous amount of, of positive changes, right? You see uh, way more women in political office and in public life. Uh, there, you, women are kind of much more visible in Indian society than they were at that point. Uh, and women from different groups uh, marginalized and otherwise. And in India particularly, there has been a huge um, rise in the level of awareness about gendered violence in particular. Um, and so you, know, you do have women who have been taking to the streets um, and expressing their political uh, views, right? And demanding equal participation, demanding equal rights. But something which has been left out of this conversation has been women's work, right? So women in the workforce has been something which, you know, many of you mentioned financial independence as something that women's empowerment is, and that's indeed something that those of us in the US and Europe, we tend, when we think women's empowerment, you know, and I'm gonna talk about the microfinance fantasy, but we kind of have that idea in mind, right? But in India, it has really meant largely political mobilization, which is really important, and we could use some of that too. But questions of women in the workplace, what kinds of options women actually have in the labor market, those have gotten marginalized a bit, right? So what I'm gonna talk about today um, is right, the, the entire context in which this is happening, right? And, and particularly two industries, the top end and the bottom end, where uh, this has been neglected or, or something that we thought was empowerment has turned out to be quite different. Now, some of you might be uh, familiar with this rather disturbing graph. This traces the women's labor workforce participation. So that's the percentage of women who are part of the workforce between the ages of, I think, 15 and 64, who are actually employed, whether part-time, informal sector, formal sector. What you see in India is that it's never been super high, right? And it kind of takes off in the early 2000s, and then it tanks, and in 2012, it's at an all-time low. It's picking up a little bit, but even by current standards, the labor, this, this number, it puts India at about 163rd in the world out of 180 countries. Right, so pretty dismal. For reference, uh, the US rate is about 56, 57%, putting the US about 70th in the world. So it's not like it's that fantastic in the US either. And we can talk about some of those connections. Now, interestingly, if we look at the global average during the same time period, it's, the shape is kind of similar, right? Uh, the shape, so the, the percentage is higher on average. Right? But during that same time period, you see the same kind of decline right, in the early 2000s and uh, a little bit of a pickup in more, in more recent years. So clearly what's happening in India is quite relevant for thinking about the world as a whole, understanding, of course, that these dynamics land differently in different places. So in the US, you've had a little bit of up and down during the same period, but it's all sort of been within the 55% range. Um, it's not really gone up. Uh, it's not really gone down, right? But you still, you might still have the same trends happening uh, within that. So I wanted to have that disclaimer. So now during the same time period, what is going on with the economy? Well, what you have in India and in the US is the rise of a service economy. Now what I mean when I'm talking about a service economy is an economy that is fueled entirely by services or primarily by services. 
right? Whether it's face-to-face -face services, retail, um, you know, financial services, what have you, rather than agriculture, rather than the production of stuff, right? This happened very powerfully in the U.S. when we transitioned from an economy that was all about industry, right, uh, and car manufacturing, and this got replaced uh, from the 1990s onward with a kind of predominance of tech, finance, healthcare positions at the top, right? These are positions that require a great deal of credentialing, a great deal of uh, professional skills. Maybe many of you have come to Wellesley specifically to get into that upper tier, right? And then at the bottom, right, a kind of whole plethora of not so good jobs that have uh, are part time, flex time, uh, are often invisible. Uh, don't have benefits, don't have a lot of room for upward mobility. This is often feminized labor, like retail, um, you know, fast food, that type of uh, massage, manicures, right? All of these personal services have grown in this service economy, and most of the labor that occurs at that bottom half really is uh, feminine labor, right? So that's what it looks like in the U.S. Now, something similar has happened in India. Now, India is not quite a service economy. We still have a lot of agriculture, a lot of manufacturing, right? So I'm not suggesting that they're the same. But the, we've had big growth in these two polarized ends in India in a very similar way. So structurally, there are some similarities. So at the top, you have tech and finance, right? A very elite uh, kind of uh, segment of the population. You need lots of credentials, lots of education, highly competitive to get into those jobs. But if you can get into them, there's a great you know, middle class life that's waiting for you. Um, and at the bottom, right, a lot of retail jobs as well as a lot of domestic work a lot of work in the informal economy. So similarly, you have this bifurcation, right? This polarized service economy unfolding in India too. And I think if we look in other parts of the world, you'll see a very similar kind of phenomenon happening, although it may have different features in different parts of the world. Now in India in particular, this bifurcated economy came with a certain promise, and it came with a promise about women's empowerment at both ends. So in the tech end, right, at the high end, the promise was that women are going to be able to have good jobs in clean environments, air conditioned, right? Be able to go sit in front of a computer, make a good living, come home at the end of the day and have a great career. Middle class women and upper middle class women, especially urban women in India, still find this promise to be very, very compelling. This is why India graduates um, more engineers, right? I mean, the, the uh, education rates uh, in engineering classes, they're now a very high, even entry level positions are about 51% women that are hired in India. And I'll talk more about the, where that, that falls short, right? But this is very much the fantasy that women are going to get educated, get a great clean job in a nice workplace and enjoy um, upward mobility. And on the other end, there's another fantasy, right? Which many of you have heard of, of the microfinance borrower who's going to get a loan, right? Uh, start a small business, make herself self-sufficient, and then raise her family out of poverty. Right? And so, so, so this service economy didn't just, it came with politi a political agenda for women's empowerment in the economic sphere at both ends. Right? And so now I'm going to get into my research kind of looking at these two positions right, to think a little bit more about what was actually going on in both of those places. So what I'm going to argue here is that women's empowerment in the service economy has not been exactly what was promised. Right? In fact, women's unpaid and underpaid domestic roles end up getting reinforced at both ends of that polarized economy, undermining women's positions in the workplace place, and compromising a holistic understanding of women's empowerment that we started out with. OK, so what does this actually look like? Now, at the high end, I started researching the Indian IT uh, industry in the early 2000s. And at that time, Thomas Friedman was writing uh, you know, columns in the New York Times about the rising Indian IT industry. And there were magazines you know, almost every week featuring uh, Indian tech in some way or another. And many of those images were feminized. So this uh, cover of Wired was literally at the grocery store one day when I was checking out. Um, in the, at the beginning of my dissertation research, right? And I was like, oh, okay, this is a big issue here, right? Um, and this woman, uh, Aparna, is featured, and I ended up meeting her and being able to interview her quite by accident. But uh, th these images were circulating very prominently in the early 2000s. This is another one kind of fantasizing. The call center worker, right, came out in 2006. Turns out that this woman is, uh, is an LA-based 
uh, Bharatanatyam dancer. Anyway, <laughs> separate, uh, interesting. Yes, yeah, she had a whole, uh, anyway, I was following her with great interest for a while as well. This is interesting how this came out. So, right, these images were not just about women in India being empowered, but also about India's ascension to a global stage. Right, where India wasn't anymore like a third world developing country, but you know, an ascendant nation uh, that had cool clothes, right, and good looking women as well, right? But it was really uplifting the overall profile of, uh, of India as a whole and doing it in a fe through a feminine face, right? But IT was the one that was going to do all of that. But when I actually conducted research in this industry, and I conducted research in a bunch of, mostly in Mumbai and Bangalore, I was talking to um, working women at different stages of their career, I found that the reality was that women in IT face what I call a sex-segregated industry. Right? So what do I mean by sex segregated? I mean that within the industry, different aspects of the work are considered masculine or feminine. Right? So things like um, human resources, right? uh, quality assurance, uh, technical writing, feminine parts of the IT industry. I went into workplaces where maybe 90% of the technical writers would be women. Right? Maybe 70% of uh, the uh, quality assurance people would be women. These were seen as kind of slower track jobs that allowed you to do other things um, that weren't taken as seriously. But product management, uh, I'm sorry, product development, strategic management, uh, those things where, that were really valued in the workplace, 80% men. Right? So what they, found, what they found is that women would, despite the fact that they would enter in pretty equal, equally, about 50%, 51% now is the most recent number for women getting recruited into this industry at the entry level, very leaky pipeline on the way up, very low odds of advancement, such that when you get to the very top, it's like single digits right, of women who actually make it up to the top. So what's happening in between, right? that was kind of what I was looking at. What I found is that women, both within the workplace as well as outside the workplace, are still expected to put their families before their careers. And this happens at every stage in the life course. And it even includes migration, which is led by men. Right? So even if, women end up, even if a woman ends up getting a good job, right, the expectation is that she will move with her male spouse. Right? Regard and that his job will be the primary one and hers will be secondary. There's an interesting twist on this. There's a recent book by Amy Butt called High Tech Housewives that I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic. She looks, um, takes it a step further and actually looks at the H-1B visa regime and the ways in which IT women kind of are forced to, whether they like it or not, put their careers second once they migrate to the US because the visa system itself requires a breadwinning man and a housekeeping woman. Right, so you kind of you can't my or you have to be a breadwinning woman and a housekeeping man, right? Which happens far less. So the H one B system kind of relies upon this structure of a particular kind of family that can get up and move at any time, even transnationally, right? And that one member of that family, one adult in that family, is not is going to be the homemaker. Right? And so, so women are often getting into this industry with the assumption that these are the kinds of troubles that they're going to face. These are the kinds of um, barriers they're going to face with an advancement. And that's why you have these single digit um, rates of women in the, in the upper echelons of the industry. OK, so let me give you some examples of what this looks like. So let's start with uh, someone I call Gautami, who was 26 at the time I interviewed her, um, a graphic designer. Um, she was not married at the time. Uh, she had a couple of siblings. And I asked her to think about her future in IT, in the IT industry and um, you know, what she saw for herself. So she says, around 35 or 40, when you're rising up the ladder, I think I'd prefer to settle down with my family and my husband, because ultimately, it's your family for whom you're doing it. And if they're not happy, it really doesn't make any difference. So it's better to spend time with them and make them happy, rather than earning money and money and money and nothing else. Right? So here is someone who is bright, right, already in the job, and is already planning on quitting. Right? Sees her long-term uh, advancement in the industry as only a question of making money. Right? A man would never think of his future as, as like, oh, well, you know, I can't just make money and money and money. What's the point in being materialistic? Right? But women, I very often heard them think about their own careers as uh, you know, not wanting to be purely for material gain. Right? That, they, that that's not what marriage was really all about. Okay, so, so clearly, before even getting married, 
you have already got a situation where women believe that they are not going to stay in it for a long time. Uh, let's look at uh, Melanie, age 30. She's been in the industry a little bit longer. She says, I, don't, I know that they don't like it when women are in their face, right? You, they expect you to be a little womanly, right? Uh, there's a special amount of feeling attached when a woman opens her mouth and is brazen, but I've not seen any overtly sexist attitudes. Our common thought is that women don't want to be around. They have a lot of other things to keep them busy. Right? So again, here, this expectation that women prefer to be mothers, that they would rather be at home, and that's what they should be doing. So even if they're in the workplace, right, the, the expectation isn't that they're really going to be giving it all in their career. Right? So, so this set of expectations um, really makes a huge difference when we're thinking about the IT industry right? And in India and kind of what kind of empowerment is possible there. So what happened is that starting in the early 2000s when I was doing my research is that there was a huge amount of policy work done. A lot of these policies were brought in from American companies through their Indian subsidiaries, but then Indian IT firms started doing it as well, right? Diversity policies to improve gender in their workplaces. So I started interviewing some of these folks who were like chief diversity officers or who were centrally involved in these kinds of efforts to make it streamlined, not just like a one-off thing, right? To actually make um, uh, you know, women, women's advancement a key part of uh, the workplace, a normal thing to make that part of, of the a successful company. However, I found a very strange thing, which is that often the very people who were crafting policy for these women, they tended to blame the women themselves for not making the shift to a kind of mindset that would promote their advancement. So let me give you an example. Someone whom I call Padmini, a chief data officer at a company I'm going to call Datacom, a big Indian IT firm, right? She says, the problem with Indian women is that we've never been independent in our life, right? Um, it's a very vicious cycle. So it's easy to frame policies. We have them all. You name it, one year sabbatical childcare, part time, flexi time, daycare. But the major mindset change we need are only from the women. Most of the time, they're confused. So if they don't want to bring a change and participate in the activities that you create for them, then the change never happens. Right? So there's this kind of culturalism, like we don't want to take the American uh, um, gender policies and you know, it doesn't really work for our women, as well as a kind of like, look, we're giving you everything you need here. If you're not going to pick it up as a worker and run with it, there's only so much we can do. Right? Very surprising to hear from a policymaker whom you would think would be quite invested. And you know, as I, I actually gave this talk, um, an, a version of it in India recently, and it was very, afterwards there was actually a whole panel on uh, gender and IT. And many of the new recent researchers have found that the situation has not changed that much. I was cautious about presenting this research you know, much long, so long after the data had been collected, but it turns out that things are quite similar. And in fact, corporate women who have been extremely successful in Indian IT very often tend to do this, uh, operate on the same kind of logic. Well, I made it, I figured it out, I made the big sacrifices. So if other women didn't, well then, you know, what can we do, right? They, they have to take the initiative. It's kind of the, another version of the lean in argument, right? Um, they're the ones who have to step up to the plate. There's not much that can be done. You know, we can't just uh, be complaining all the time. Right? So, so that logic, and it's especially among privileged women who were able to make the childcare arrangements, able to put everything together to make it and continue on in the industry. And even they get edged out after 15 or 20 years. Right? They're not going on to become CEOs or upper management within the company, although they seldom don't talk about what pushed them out in the end. Right? So, so there's a lot of interesting kind of contradictory dynamics that are going on here. OK, let's go all the way to the other end um, in the interest of time as well. Every, how many people have heard this story, the microfinance fantasy, right? That a woman gets a loan, uh, she um, buys a sewing machine or some other machine, make, creates a great business for herself, right? Uh, pulls her family out of poverty. It's a familiar story. Everyone in this room, if you are in this room, you have probably heard this story multiple times. So I conducted research in the commercial IT industry. So this is a for-profit. Um, sector of the financial industry in India that has boomed in the last 15 or 20 years. And I was interested in looking at um, not only the client end, but also the institutional end, right? How do you create an institution that's supposed to be for a financial good or social good, but that is primarily concerned with profit making? You know, how does that actually work? So what I found is that rather than this fantasy, the reality is that microfinance clients gain loans, gain access to loans because they are mothers. Right? 
So it's actually motherhood, right? And, and why is that? It's because being a mother makes them a better financial risk. It makes them less likely to move, less likely to leave the neighborhood, right? They are tied to a spouse, right? And, and so actually microfinance, the hidden collateral behind microfinance is motherhood, right? And this is something that people never talk about, but in all of the context that I went to, right, the women who got loans, they were mothers. I think I encountered one woman who was not married, right, who was taking her very first loan. The rest of them married with children. This is seen as another stream of income uh, for their livelihoods, right? So unlike the fantasy that we have, most microfinance client clients are not entrepreneurs. They are domestic workers, factory workers, agricultural workers, and they rely on a husband's wage, at least in theory. And so what I mean by this is that when you actually go and collect the data, right? Uh, I'm sorry, when you collect the, when the bank officer goes through and sort of collects the data about each individual so to make the loan, they, you actually have to write down, this is the name of my husband, this is how much money he makes, this is uh, all the details about him, and the husband has to actually act as a kind of guarantor for the loan. So this idea that somehow women are just insuring themselves and it's all about women's relationships, that hides a lot of what is going on. The entire microfinance industry, at least in India, is very much based on this idea that maintains the male breadwinner and the woman homemaker ideal, right? Um, so very few of them are entrepreneurs. You do encounter some, and most of those end up on the glossy uh, pictures of uh, these companies' kind of um, websites or brochures. So they are prominently featured. Now for some women, right, for most women I would say, access to loans ends up trapping them in low wage work permanently. Right? And so what I mean by this is that the, impulse, the, the, the requirement to pay back the loan every two weeks or every month, right? it's small amounts of money, high rates of interest, they have to be paid back. You can't really invest in, say, education, right? go to school for a long time, or do anything that would require, allow you to really move out of that particular strata because the loan terms are so tight. Right? So women are kind of in a particular kind of low-end work, and they stay there. It's not that micro, maybe microfinance is helping them and sort of providing an extra cushion, but it's not breaking their position in the labor market in any significant way. And for some women, they get sort of trapped in these uh, you know, loan uh, cycles where they are you know, unable, they get into kind of a debt trap and they're unable to get out of it. And that's a worst case scenario. It does happen more frequently than is often reported. Um, and, and, and keep in mind that microfinance institutions, when they report these 95, 99, 98% repayment rates, those are produced, right? So they go back, the women who paid on time, they go back and give them another loan. And the women who didn't are kind of expunged from the rules and they're not going back to them. So it's, it, it, they're a little bit deceiving, those rates, right? They cover up a lot of processes that are going on behind the scenes. Okay, so let me give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, a little bit uh, about uh, someone I'm calling Ambuja, also age 26, former garment worker, right? She worked, uh, garment work in India is not uh, that fun and not that garment work ever is, right? Uh, very excruciating conditions, um, long hours, etc. She met her husband who was also working at the garment factory. They had a love marriage. His parents were against it. Somehow they got married anyway. And when I met her, she had a toddler daughter that was running around and she had given up her job at the garment industry and taken, and the garment factory, and taken two microfinance loans at the maximum that you can take. She was going to start a sari business, which is a business where you buy saris in bulk and you sell them to people in your neighborhood on an installment basis. Now, if you spend any time in Indian slums, you know every other woman has this business. They can't possibly all succeed, and I can't imagine how even half of them do, because how many saris can one buy? Well, a lot, but in, in these particular circumstances where women have quite small homes, you, you really can't buy that many of them, right? So this seemed to me like a shaky business idea from the outset. But Ambuja says, I can do the, house, the work in the house and take care of the baby and I get money. I'm 100% happy. I, uh, it's better than garment work. I want to expand my business step by step. Um, today, if they give me 100 rupees, tomorrow, if they give me an extra 20, that is sufficient, right? So she's super nice, right, um, and, and accepting of her circumstance. But the fact is what she's reporting does not really seem like this loan is going to make a significant impact in terms of allowing her to break out of her subordinate position in the labor market, right? She's really going to be trapped there. And I'm not saying the garment work was a whole lot better, right, but at least there was a regular wage coming in, right? Maybe it's not possible with the baby, there's so many other factors, right? But she's certainly not changing up her position. 
Okay, now similar to what I was talking about in the world of IT, policymakers and microfinance are fully cognizant of these dynamics and they end up, uh, they, what they, well, I'll, I'll give another example of the blame, but um, they, they, they are fully aware of these dynamics and they wish to support the male breadwinner, female housekeeper um, model. So Shankaran, this is a veteran uh, policymaker. He's been making policy about this from the 1980s, currently sits on a number of boards within commercial microfinance organizations. He says, if she, uh, the microfinance client, says, I have given the money to my husband, he's running his rickshaw because he requires money, well, isn't that empowering gender? Look, finally, the food has come to the table. The woman becomes functional for getting that done. She gains her space, her respect. Food comes to the table for everyone. Right? This is not a feminist agenda we are driving here. It is a livelihood agenda where both of them have a contribution to make and the household feels comparatively better off. Right? Now, what's great about Shankaran, he's thinking about two people in the household. He's thinking about the power dynamics within it. He believes that economic dynamics affect that. All fantastic, right? But in no sense is he thinking about the woman as being a worker at all. Never is he thinking about the woman as having any type of access to the labor market. In fact, he's presuming that she's dependent, right? And seeing the money as a way for her to maintain that status, right? With, and still have some power within the household. Now, similar to IT, right, you often have policymakers at the top who end up blaming the women who don't use their entrepreneurial capacities um, to bring themselves up. And they often do that in a way that's, that's quite surprising. So this is uh, someone I'm calling Maya, from, uh, who was a head of client education they, at this uh, big um, uh, microfinance institution. So they did these um, women's empowerment educational programs, right? the kind that you would think would be great. So they go into neighborhoods and they actually um, offer women like this. Here's how you can improve your business. right? Here's how, these are the way you have to think about marketing. This is the way that you have to think about your market. This is how you have to think about your niche. You know, think about who you are, your identity as an entrepreneur, right? I mean, it's just, if you imagine what is women's empowerment, that's what you would think of in those trainings, right? So she has, is working with one of these groups and finds that um, in one of them, uh, a woman has received a huge order to uh, embroider burqas from Saudi Arabia, right? Like thousands of them. And that woman who received the order is not getting any support from anyone else in her group to help her with this humongous order. And so, um, you know, Maya's looking at the registration cards and finds that like six of the women in the group um, had said that they're embroiderers, but none of them had volunteered to be part of this project, right? So she says, I just stood there and said, look, Husseina is asking for five tailors to do embroidery for her. Why are you sitting quiet? You know, instantaneously, your empowerment, your motivation should be to just get up and get that order. You know, what made you keep quiet? And then she, one of the women who said that she was a tailor and said, I'm nothing great I'm doing. I thought, you know, why should I put that on paper? Why should I step up for this opportunity? Then I realized they are shy to disclose their identity as an entrepreneur. So, you know, in this case, Maya actually thought there's something wrong. These women are just, they're, they're too oppressed. They're not coming out with their abilities. But a little bit of work in the neighborhood, you come to find out that embroidery is devalued work, right? You can, women will tell you, yeah, if I work on a, an outfit for an entire day, the materials cost me 250, you know, 175, I try to sell it for 300 and people want it for 250, right? Like they know that the work that they put into it is not going to yield very much. Doing embroidery is really crappy work. Right? It's piece-based, it's really, really hard, and sure, like who would want to do 4,000 of them? Right? So maybe there were some of the women that were shy, maybe she's not wrong, but certainly all of the women would not have just not stepped up because they were shy. Right? So there's some way in which empowerment programming, by blaming the women for somehow being inadequate, ends up kind of shortchanging itself and not really looking at the key issues about livelihood that drive women to make particular calculations about what to participate in. Okay, so just to wrap up, the polarized service economy has left women behind at both ends of this new economy. Why is that? So what I'm arguing here is that in both sectors, the work of mothering continues to be unpaid or underpaid, right? Both of them are underpinned by this expectation that women wish to be mothers first and put everything else second, right? Now, the other factor is that respectability politics in both situations are real. So often women feel rewarded socially for staying out of the workforce, right? Because their societies or their immediate surroundings, um, you know, wish for them to be mothers first. And so they find that to be an easier decision to make. However, these respectability politics are more malleable than you might think. 
There has been some wonderful research done by Nyla Kabir in Bangladesh on garment workers in the early 2000s, right? And she finds that when there are opportunities for good work, women are able to turn that into um, you know, a way of supporting the family, right? That the way that women from very conservative families in Dhaka, right, sent their daughters far away, right, uh, to be able to work in the garment factories, as soon as the women were able to articulate, well, I'm doing it for the family, I'm doing this as part of, uh, you know, to support, uh, to be a good daughter, right? They redefined what it meant to be a good daughter, and it worked, right? So, so respectability, an important thing, we can discuss it, but then more malleable than, uh, than you might think, even in regions like South Asia, right? Important part of, the, uh, of this entire equation is that there are relatively few well-paid jobs for moderately educated women in the middle. Right? So we're talking about the opposite end. In the meantime, India and many other countries like India have had a huge um, rise in women's education, right? going back to the point earlier about keep girls in school. Right? So a lot of people have, have heeded that advice. But they find that when they have a moderate level of education, that they can't necessarily get a great job uh, or even a well-paid, stable job with that moderate level of education because it's either very high or nothing at all. Right? And so there, there is a structural issue with the, way, the kinds of jobs that are available in the service economy that we require thinking about. OK, so I don't want to spend too much more time. There is a lot of relevance for, of this for thinking beyond India. And I just, I'll just maybe just spend one minute and we can talk about this more um, if people are interested in. But with the end of the Cold War, right? A really key thing that happened is that the US model of the nuclear family, that mobile family that can get up and move anywhere for job opportunities, that won out, even though the Soviet Union crumbled for all kinds of other reasons. Right? And so um, that model has had great influence all over the world. Right? And um, in India, there were extended families right? uh, and, and a different kind of model of the family that has given away to a nuclear family that, Im that is very much like the US ideal. Right? And so, so there's, I mean, there's a lot that's a huge generalization. There's a lot to unpack there, but just something to think with. I've written um, you know, about this with a colleague, and so if you're interested, you can take a look at that. Um, and, and, and still, you know, the, the bigger picture is that women workers, you know, they fueled the, inter the Industrial Revolution. Today, they comprise the majority of factory workers in the world. But we continue, women continue to be uh, viewed as auxiliary workers who are earning an auxiliary income. And this goes back to the, the whole point that the, the reason that is is because they're viewed as women, as uh, mothers first. Right? So India's challenges are similar to those in other parts of the world. And neoliberal capitalism in the form that we have now really rests upon women being viewed as auxiliary, um, non-essential labor, which is then devalued and paid as such, right? despite the other contributions that are made. So um, there's ways that we can rethink gendered empowerment. Right? We need to rethink not just kind of giving women a few more jobs, creating a few more jobs, but really think, rethink these key binaries that structure what is valued and what is not valued. Right? Public, private, work, home, economy, family. Everything on the left is valued and paid. Everything on the right sustains it, but is not. Right? And so really, really thinking about what are the systems of value that we propagate. Um, and then I've already talked about sort of women's empowerment tending to overlook elite and working class women's equal access to the market. Um, and, and so, you know, I want, I want to end by just reinstating this idea that when we think about individual empowerment and political empowerment, right, that's very powerful. We need that. And I, I don't mean to shortchange it at all, right? But without thinking about economic uh, empowerment without thinking about access to the labor market, without thinking about real advancement, right, within that labor market, the, the term is, is hollow, right? And in order to do that, we need to reconceptualize what we think work is. We need to reconceptualize what we think is valued, right? And that is a long process, but at least we can start asking those kinds of questions, right? What would that actually look like? What constitutes paid work? Right? Without that equal stake in the workforce and fair work that rewards education, then any type of vision of women's empowerment will be ultimately compromised and shortchanged. So I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to your questions.